essentially what I know is what everybody of my generation knew about the Magic Roundabout, which was that it was this peculiar animation that came from France and yet was voiced by Eric Thompson. And the story that we were all told, I, could be, I think it was a story that went around playgrounds, I'm, you know, the truth of it I've never really understood was that essentially what would happen is that Eric Thompson would look at these animations that had been brought in by the BBC and would do completely new voices for them without uh, hearing the original script. So rather than getting in uh, an animation, I mean, you know, I have actually, funnily enough, got some videotapes of the French versions of uh, whatever it is, Enchanté, the Enchanted Roundabout, because uh, I can't understand what they're saying. But everything about it is tonally completely different. And as far as I understand, what happened was that uh, Thompson was asked to look at this stuff and said, you know, you tell us what the characters are, you tell us what you think they're doing, you, think, you tell us what you think they're saying which is one thing when you're talking about a little four or five minute uh, short, because actually in most of the Magic Roundabout uh, episodes, stuff happens, but it's one particular thing happens, like you know, one day the garden will be taken over by a funny plant, or one day a visitor will come in, it'll be just be one thing. That's completely different when you get into a feature film. But as far as, as, far as I understood it, and I do think this is true, Eric Thompson would literally sit down and watch them and go, this is what I think the, uh, the story is, this is what I think the voices are, this is what I think the characters are. And there's something about what Eric Thompson is doing, there's something about the tone of his voice which is, inc which is really funny for a start, but also seems to be deeply anarchic and you know, crazy and inventive in a, in, in a very, very British way. Now, I don't often get confused, but this was very confusing. I got out of bed and wandered about. Now, this is also very unusual, because if there's one thing I don't do, it's wander about in the middle of the night. I mean, the thing I remember most profoundly about Magic Roundabout was you'd sit in front of the television, you'd watch it with your mum and dad, and your dad would laugh, and your mum would laugh, and we'd laugh. And I didn't get the sense that that was what you would get out of the French. And you have to remember, Magic Roundabout came on television just before the news, right? It was the point when kids were going to bed, dad was coming home from work, you know, um, it was the one moment in the, in the evening when kids' television would intersect with grown-up television. You know, it'd be the end of kids' TV, the beginning of grown-up TV, and it was probably the time of evening when everyone was in the house. And it was the one five minutes when suddenly, around the same television set, you'd have the young kids, the mum, the dad, whoever, and they'd all sit and watch the thing together, and they'd all enjoy it. Could you, by any chance, give me a lift? That depends. Depends? What on? You're a public service vehicle, aren't you? Well, that may be, but it doesn't mean air can be taken advantage of. Oh, all right. Don't get all steamed up. <laughs> I, I, I think the important thing to remember is even the character names are different. So all the characteristics that you think of, for example, when we think of Dougal, right, we know what Dougal was, you know, he's this curmudgeonly character, we know all those things about him, you know, he reads the Times and he writes letters to the Times. All that stuff is not actually in the pictures, it's in the voiceover. It's not, in the, he's, a diff, he's got a different name. And apparently in the French version, you know, the characters are completely different. And of course they are, because the characters that we know, the characters that we love, came effectively out of the mouth of Eric Thompson. I didn't offer. I didn't offer. He can't stay in my bed. Where will I sleep? What will people say? What? Have a good rest, said Florence. I'll try. I love Dougal and the Blue Cat. I first saw Dougal and the Blue Cat when I was, I suppose, six or seven years old. I was taken to the cinema to see it, and I remember going to the cinema to see it, and I'd been completely knocked out by it. I mean, it's really strange and freaky and weird and funny, but also quite frightening in places, all the stuff with the factory and, you know, the blue voice, and it's very mysterious. And, and uh, you know, like all great sort of, uh, you know, ch children's entertainment, it works for adults and kids, and it, some of it's really funny, some of it's really scary. I claim this moon for me, King Boxton. I think the extraordinary thing about Dougal and the Blue Cat is how well it does hold together as a, you know, as a proper film. People always sort of laugh when you say, I love Dougal and the Blue Cat. They go, yeah, they think you're being sort of cute, like saying I love tweenies or something like that. But it's, it's, seriously, it is a really fantastic film. For, and there's two reasons. One of them is that the visuals are just extraordinary i mean they are very very odd it's got these kind of angular shapes the the whole journey as they go off to the castle and they, there's that really weird thing in which um 
Buxton has to go through all the various doors in order to become the Blue King, which is a really strange sequence. He goes into the room of nightmares. I mean, these are, this is stuff which is freaky, horror film inspired, almost kind of, um, almost German expressionist in the way it looks. The whole section when they go to the moon, which is really bizarre and seems to sort of hark back to, you know, very, very early cinema and obviously looks forward to, you know, Wallace and Gromit going to the moon. I mean, those things are all connected. So on the one hand, there's the visuals. On the other hand, there's the consistency of voice of the narrative, which is Eric Thompson and the songs and the voice of Fenella Fielding. I'm blue, I'm beautiful, I'm best. And what's extraordinary is just how well it holds together. Because often what happens when you take a little five minute thing and you expand it to feature length, I mean, I know it's not a very long feature, but what happens is you get a series of five minute sketches. But in the case of uh, Dougal and the Blue Cat, it is a proper story. Oh. Uh, why aren't you with the others? They're all captured, you know. Captured. It's written in, in the way that children's entertainment should be written, treating children as if they are as every bit as smart, every bit as intelligent, every bit as, every bit as attuned to tiny nuances as grown-up audiences. It doesn't telegraph things. I mean, that's the really clever thing. You get the story from these tiny little gestures, and these tiny little intonations, these tiny little inflections of the voice that you understand you know great complexities of character as a result of that which sounds like a really pompous way of talking about magic roundabout but there's a reason that magic roundabout has survived and it's not what everyone says oh well it was all to do with students because that's nonsense that's total nonsense it's to do with people of all ages watching it being enchanted by the strangeness of the animation and being completely swept away by the sound of those voices oh madam you are clever you're making flowers Blue flowers. Correct, Sir Buxton. Fenella Fielding's voice as the blue voice. You know, obviously, when I first saw Dougal and the Blue Cat, I don't think I'd seen Carrie on screaming. I think I saw that later on. And um, and I remember the hair on the back of my neck. I mean, it was a kid going up when you, you know, that blue is beautiful. And uh, Fenella Fielding's voice. Years later, as a result of this kind of obsession that I developed with Dougal and the Blue Cat, I was doing the Radio 1 film programme that I co-presented with Mary Ann Hobbs, and Mary Ann had to go away for a couple of weeks, and Radio 1 said to me, if you could have anyone as a co-presenter, who would you have? I said, get Fenella Fielding. And so for two weeks, I presented the film programme on Radio 1 with Fenella Fielding, so I could be in the same studio as that voice. And it's, you know, it's one of those voices that, there's just nothing like it. It's the voice of liquid chocolate, and it's so you know, fruity and expressive and strange and sinister and, and you know, it's, she has a radio perfect voice. Success, King Buxton! Let's not overlook how great the songs are. Florence's sad song just every single time reduces me to tears. Shall we ever see the sun again? Shall we ever feel the rain again? So I figured I had to play Florence's sad song on the guitar and then on the piano and then on the French horn later on. And I think I can also play it on the ukulele. But it's a really, really heartbreaking song. And he sings it in such a beautiful way. And, uh, you know, and I'm the King is funny. And, you know, and, and it's got the, you know, mad piano stuff in it. And those are great show songs. And they're perfectly paced throughout the, you know, throughout the film to just give you, you know, enough of that kind of, you know, knees up feeling before it gets back. The scene of them all being trapped in the, in the dungeons all with the chains clanking together is, is really, really sad. The scene of Dougal being shut in the cage when it, the only thing he can't do is eat the sugar. Is it, is it, it's a classic moment, you know, it's so the rotter because he knows, he knows that if, Blue Peter eats the sugar, then he's Dougal. And Dougal has this, this sort of soliloquy, you know, yes, no, yes, to eat or not to eat, that is the question. Whether it is no, oh, shut up, Dougal. And I mean, it's, it's just heartbreaking, but it's also really fiendish. It is really, it's all oh, the fiend. Well, exactly, it's such a fiendish thing. Lock him in a room full of sugar and see whether he eats any. What am I going to do? I genuinely think that it's, a masterpiece. I think it's a wonderful film that has stayed with me throughout my life, that really moved and touched me the first time I saw it, and really stayed with me through listening to that soundtrack album. And, you know, my cat was called Buxton, and, you know, and 
it's just something that doesn't go away because it's timeless. It is like a, you know, like, like Grimm's fairy tales or any of the kind of classic or in the early Disney's. It has a timeless quality to it. It's not a period piece. So I just hope that, you know, people get a chance to see it and to be enchanted by it in the way that I was. And um, and I, I think it'll stand the test of time because I think it's a genuinely timeless film. I mean, I'm not being funny about this. I genuinely think it's a masterpiece. Thank you.